Hello everyone, welcome to the design of a personal single stage to interstellar space plane and SSTI in Kerbal Space Program 1.2.2. The goal here is to design a craft that would be piloted by a single Kerbal that can take off from the runway, get into orbit around Earth. This is realism overhaul, real solar system, everything with Fermi Aerospace, and then travel to another star system, in this case Alpha Centauri. And so here we have the KSP interstellar parts, which we will, we will absolutely need. We've got the warp drive, we've got the antimatter-induced fusion reactor, we've got a charged particle electric generator, we've got uh, thermal turbojets, and we'll have a single turbo ramjet eventually after I work on the details of this. We also have a cryogenic chamber, just in case we have a long trip. The Kerbal will not want to consume food, water, and oxygen. We don't want to carry all that for the long trips, so the Kerbal will just freeze themselves and let the computer take over for the rest of the trip. And uh, here we are crafting the aerodynamic surfaces of the vehicle. Because there's so much mass in the back, we have to make sure that the wing is in the back. There's no other way to put it, otherwise uh, the center of lift would not be in the right place. Uh, I'll also have to eventually increase how many warp drives we have because right now we don't have the right warp capacity. Here you see me adding the helium-3 tanks. In previous missions, my interstellar overhaul series, I figured out that we need a lot of helium-3 and deuterium to run the reactor, and so those are the two tanks that I've got on the top there that look like R2-D2 units kind of things. But anyway, that's what they're for. And of course, air intakes because uh, initially when we're in the atmosphere, it's going to draw air in from the atmosphere and then send that through the reactor and that will produce our thrust. Uh, once we get out of the atmosphere, we'll need to use our fuel. But we don't actually use fuel until we get out of the atmosphere. So that's really handy because uh, instead of using fuel to ignite the, the air, we're going to be just using the reactor heat to ignite the air. So here we are. Uh, sorry about the lack of sound. Unfortunately, um, I can't use the sound for in the initial recording, which was during a live stream. So uh, here we are verifying that it can take off. At least it can do that. But you can notice that it's listing to the right a little bit. And there's definitely an imbalance. At this point, I figure it's probably because we don't have enough vertical stabilization. You know, the the stabilizers on the edge of the wings, they're not really that big compared to normal stabilizers for aircraft. So we might need more of those, or at least somewhat larger ones. What I didn't notice at this point was that we were actually using hydrazine. You also noted the message that said that our solar panels are broken by aerodynamic forces, so that's not good. Um, but I need to switch from using hydrazine to using atmosphere. And when I do that, it provides a ridiculous amount of thrust. You can see we're already past the sound barrier and when I pull up it all just breaks apart. So we need to control the thrust a little bit more. First of all, I put more vertical stabilization to ensure that we don't drift as much as we did, though that wasn't the only cause of it. Uh, I'll find that out eventually. And uh, here we're taking off again. And instead of having one big uh, thermal turbojet, we have two smaller ones. Now again, taking air from the atmosphere, sending it through the reactor directly, and that's what's coming out, the superheated air. And once again, the solar panels break. Eventually, I'll remove those. And But otherwise, everything else is looking fine, and we can get to a fairly high altitude. And the thermal turbojets are still working strong. Here we are. Still not past the speed of sound, and that's because I was throttled down by quite a lot. And now we're breaking Mach 1. And then at 16 kilometers, we are past Mach 2, and I'm looking to switch to hydrazine mode, uh, but the problem is I don't have that action grouped, and they don't do it automatically, so that was a little bit tricky, and when I decide that it was time to maybe pull up in preparation for lighting the rocket engines, I mean lighting the igniting hydrazine mode, which would be the equivalent of turning it into rocket engines, basically these thermal turbojets are the same as rapiers, uh, it all went out of whack. So action grouping, the switch between propellants, very important. Uh, there is a caveat though, uh, it reads water as a potential propellant and we are carrying some water for the Kerbal to drink and because tack life support and that is, well, we'll you, you'll see. Eventually it'll switch to water, consume all the water instantly basically because <laughs> uh, we're not carrying that much 
and that won't be a good thing. So we have to figure out how to avoid the water. Uh, here I've got the reactor window open to see how many days of helium-3 and deuterium we have. The antimatter, we're carrying antimatter because it's an antimatter induced fusion reactor, um, is not a problem. We've got many years of that, so don't need to refuel that, but yeah, HE3 and deuterium definitely need to work on. Okay, well, this barely holding it there. Um, here I'm using the RCS as well, thankfully, uh, but Smart ASS is not very good at uh, using these particular RCS ports, regardless of uh, other tweaking. So yeah, I uh, had to stop using Smart ASS hopefully very soon. Oh, too late. Yep, it's all gone pear-shaped on this attempt, and I also had noticed that uh, warp drives, even though we now have two warp drives, you'll notice there, uh, that wasn't enough. So the first thing I did was actually uh, try out one of these foldable warp drives, which which is much heavier. It's like five times heavier than the other warp drives we were holding, but it also has five times the warp capacity. They are uh, they have a warp capacity commensurate to their mass. In fact, I think the total mass of the warp drives is more than 10% of our overall mass. And then that's not including the reactor that's required to run the warp drive. Our warp drive speed, our top warp speed is limited by the reactor. And actually the top warp speed of this after it's used up its fuel to get to orbit is 63 times the speed of light. Uh, to take a break from all that during the live stream, I showed off some of my other designs with uh, KSP interstellar parts. You can see it is an X-wing. Yes, the wings do fold out. Uh, this is just uh, to show, show off, basically. And of course, if you saw my Intercell overhaul series, you've seen the Normandy before and that, that with custom bodywork there. Actually, this is the Intercell overhaul save and we actually have a Normandy around Jupiter right now. We did warp it over to Jupiter. The warp uh, coils are inside the body of the Normandy. And then this is the Phoenix and you can see it is from Star Trek First Contact and we've got the Dragon Capsule on top, a little bit of a supply area, and then the warp drive, and then a whole lot of radiators, and these nacelles uh, need some work, and actually they're quite wobbly when, when in use, so a little bit of a worrisome situation there, but uh, nifty anyway, definitely functional. And of course, uh, the Enterprise, NCC-1701, and this has flown to orbit before, though it was tough going and I probably would take quite a few tries to try and do it again. Um, it's only got one crew member though. Uh, this is not actual crew space, though I could probably uh, sneak some in without any trouble. And uh, yeah, it's got uh, impulse drives to help it get into orbit. A total of six uh, of the antimatter induced. Oh, I think these might not be antimatter induced. These might be straight antimatter reactors. Uh, so they, they consume a lot of antimatter, but you can see 14,000 meters per second of delta V with a 1.4 sea level thrust to weight ratio, so that's all good. The warp coils are in the warp nacelles at where they should be. Where the body is covered with radiator panels, that's where the reactor is, so um, very easy to tell that. And we do have a shuttle bay in the back, so all is good there, but we, we do need to work on it a little bit to make sure it still works. Anyway. After showing off, I proceeded with the main launch, but I thought that some of you might not have known about those other craft that I have made before, so it's worth revisiting them every now and again. So this one is obviously feeling a lot heavier. You can see it's struggling a little bit more to take off. It's still wiggling a lot as far as the yaw is concerned. Not totally stable there. We could probably tune down the control surfaces a little bit, but we do get to a decent speed and altitude. We're we're uh, right about at the sound barrier. It is transonic right now, and everything is looking good. So I proceed to higher altitude, and we're now past the speed of sound, and I'm going to light the ramjet, which we added. So we've got two little thermal turbojets, and it doesn't seem like we need too much more than those tiny ones, because I was at half throttle all the way up. And then I go for the thermal ramjet, but it started off in non-atmospheric mode and took some of the hydrazine. And with the ramjet, you just need the ramjet. You can turn the turbojets off. I learned that during this stream. And the question is now going into hydrazine mode, which we did there, and then proceeding up. And 
it's just not pulling up. It's just not. And what I find out is that this does not have any gimbling. This particular thermal ramjet nozzle does not gimbal. And that's not particularly helpful in this situation. You can see our time to apoapsis is going down. And by the time I turn on the RCS, things are already going badly. Uh, the reason things are going badly is we, we only have RCS. I didn't realize I didn't have RCS on symmetry. And also, uh, we are not pulling the fuel from the wing tanks symmetrically. There is hydrazine in the wings, and they are not draining symmetrically, uh, thereby unbalancing things. But we got to do a pseudo reentry test anyway. We weren't all the way up at orbit, and we weren't going anywhere near those velocities. But at least we saw some of the handling characteristics, and it was, uh, well, considering it only had RCS on one side and it was fundamentally unbalanced, it, it didn't do too badly. And so I was satisfied with that. I wasn't going to try and splash it down. I decided to go straight into making the edits. And you can see me here checking on the fuel situation, adding those RCS ports where they ought to be because that wasn't in symmetry. So off we go again. Will it make it this time? We will find out. Okay, taking off. Looks like a much better lift off. No clear indication that it's veering off to one side, so that's good. Past the speed of sound here. Now getting ready for the turbo ramjet. And there it is. It doesn't have much of a flame to it, unfortunately. Yep, uh, a little bit lackluster on that. It does have more of a flame when switching fuels, though. And it consumed all of our water right there. Yep, that's not so good. So, uh, well, now Carlin Kerman is going to have to be frozen for a trip, definitely, because otherwise uh, she would die without the water. Trying to manage the throttle here. It's a little bit wiggly going up, but still stable. You can see about halfway through to orbit. Everything is looking good. Time to apoapsis going up. With so much thrust to weight ratio available to us, I get to just coast to apoapsis, which I rarely do in realism overhaul. Much more common in the Kerbal system in stock. And here we are completing orbit. And uh, we've, we've got a reasonable margin. We've got about enough to like transfer to the moon would be how much delta V we have left, about 3,000. I need to boost a little bit higher to run the warp drive. The closer we are to the Earth, the more restrictive the warp drive is. And at that altitude, our reactor is not powerful enough to initiate the warp drive at th that low a speed. So we put uh, Carl and Kerman into cryogenic suspension because otherwise the water situation would be dire. Uh, Carlin could probably survive for a little bit without water, but not for a long time. And we're going to be talking about uh, many days, probably a month or so. And we activate warp drive. You can see starting out at 0.04 times the speed of light. Um, it takes the least amount of reactor power to run it exactly at the speed of light. It takes a lot more to uh, run it at low, low warp uh, multiples and high warp multiples. So off we go starting off at the low warp multiples. Here I was just trying to get some screenshots honestly. It is pretty cool after all we got to orbit uh, just on this single stage nothing dropped off. Of course we're, we've got all the KSB interstellar parts. It's not that much of a challenge but you know uh, it's still cool. So here we are heading out and uh, we're 11 days out now and we've got an uh, encounter with Proxima Centauri. Now this puzzled me because I wanted an encounter with Alpha Centauri but it wouldn't give me, even though we were aimed right at Alpha Centauri and I adjusted along the way, you can see me adjusting here and uh, you can see the white dot there is Alpha Centauri it just wouldn't give me an a encounter with Alpha Centauri it would only give me an encounter with Proxima so I think that might be a matter of how RSS Constellations, the mod that adds all the other stars, is set up. So yeah, I, I guess that's just going to be how it is because Proxima has planets around it and Alpha A and Alpha B do not. So yeah, alright, I, I can deal with that. I was a little bit disappointed during the stream though. You can see we've heated up quite a lot and our radiators are glowing. Waste heat is more than halfway so we'll probably need to have more radiator panels for future missions with this. 
Here I'm going for Alpha B, Alpha Centauri B, uh, which is the companion of A. Not quite so big, a little bit redder. And then I turn, you can see me making a turn here for home. So we're going back home now because I can't get a SY change into Alpha B either. So it's not indicating that I'm in uh, either one's SOI, which is a little bit weird, but I don't know how you add extra stars into uh, real solar system anyway with Copernicus and all, so I can't really judge. Here we go, back to the solar system. You can see our planets there, Pluto on the outer ring there. And I try to get back to Earth, but of course we have a lot of residual velocity. We did come out of warp in the Alpha Centauri system, so we, uh, we're carrying a lot of momentum with us. And that means it's a little bit hard. Also, a little bit of time has elapsed. We've got 51 days elapsed. And so Earth is in a different position than it was before. That's a factor, too. Um, by the way, uh, Carlin was on ice the whole time, totally cryogenic frozen, cryogenically frozen. So didn't really get to enjoy the Alpha Centauri system, I have to say. But uh, yeah, you can see a little pale blue dot there, and that is Earth. Uh, we didn't actually get to a low orbit around Earth. I still have to work on that. Uh, I still have to work on getting captured once I return from a voyage like this. But for now, that's the system. That was the SSTI space plane, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.